And what I'm going to talk about is um, a tool uh, known as the Tomato Genome Browser that can help sort of incorporate um, some of the resources that um, David has shown us and also that Alan has shown us. And these will be in more of a, a visual format. So I've separated my talk into two parts today. And to begin with, we're going to look at uh, just first of all, what is a genome browser? Um, when I started putting this talk together, um, you know, I realized that we weren't just going to be talking to, say, geneticists or bioinformaticists. And, you know, a lot of people may never have seen a genome browser or have a vague concept of what it is, but not really have a clear understanding. And secondly, <coughs> whoops, where can I find the tomato genome browser? And what kinds of information can I see and where does it come from? And then in the second part of my talk today, I'm going to demonstrate the use of the Tomato Genome Browser to help us identify uh, markers linked to bacterial spot resistance based on a publication that came out um, uh, from David's lab previously. So to begin with, I think um, it's clear to everyone based on uh, the previous talks given by both Alan and David that there is a lot of public information available related to tomato sequence, a lot of sequence data available. For example, there are more than 2,500 molecular markers on the high-density tomato map, and there are more than 300,000 ESTs in GenBank, which uh, is part of the NCBI um, website that David described. And as well, we have two draft genome sequences. And we also have a lot of data from other species that may be helpful to us, including Arabidopsis and potato. And data is being rapidly generated. Um, you know, David gave the example of 100 genomes or 100 additional genomes being sequenced um, in tomato by a group in China. So how can we integrate all of this data? Just to give you a definition of a genome browser, so Wikipedia defines it as a graphical interface for the display of information from a biological database for genomic data. Genome browsers enable researchers to visualize and browse entire genomes with annotated data, including gene prediction and structure, proteins, expression, regulation, variation, and comparative analysis. So there is a lot of information available that we may want to see, and it's very easy to get overwhelmed. So the Tomato Genome Browser has been created um, using GBrowse, which is a, what's called a generic genome browser. So GBrowse has been used for many species, and it can be customized um, to suit the particular needs or desires of a, com of a particular community. And you can find a, an introductory tutorial here, and I would highly recommend for anyone who's never used a genome browser before to check this out. Um, it's about a 10-minute video, and it gives you an idea of the basic layout, um, how to access annotation data, customizing your tracks, um, and how to upload and incorporate your own data, which gets a little bit beyond um, what we may want to look at here. Uh, I put together this talk as more of from an end user point of view. So first of all, where can I find the Tomato Genome Browser? So if you go to the Soul Genomics Network, and then select Genomes, uh, and Browse the Tomato Genome Data, you can see here, if you click on this Browse um, link, it will bring you to the Tomato Genome Browser. So at this point, it's a little bit of a roundabout way to get there. Um, there isn't just a, hey, I want to look at the Genome Browser button, even if you go under uh, Genomes on the Soul Genomics Network. So at last, we've got our t Tomato Genome Browser. and um, if you're anything like me, the first time you saw something like this, you were pretty immediately overwhelmed. 
and thought, what in the world am I looking at and how is this possibly going to be useful to me? And so my, my whole point in being here today is to try to help break down that barrier, particularly for people who have never used a genome browser before. Because I think once that you start to use it and spend some time with it, um, you can become relatively, easy, uh, relatively at ease using the browser. So first of all, on our top line here, what I've pointed as the overview, this is really what am I looking at here? And this spits out this string of information, which at this point may not mean a lot to you, but I hope that soon it will. So it says, I tag release genomic annotations, 969 base pairs from this scaffold of Solanum lipoprotein. So how did we sort of get there? Um, we searched for a region and we selected a source. And both of those I'm going to go over in more detail in the second half of this presentation. And one of the key functions that we have here is this scroll tool. So it allows us to um, scroll back and forth throughout the sequence that we're, or throughout the region of the scaffold or genome that we're looking at here. And also it allows us to zoom in or zoom out to look at more or less of um, a scaffold at one point in time. So, okay, you're still scared. Um, maybe thinking, oh, can Heather please just finish talking? Or, in the case of my dog, can Heather please get me out of here? She's really trapped me in a bad spot here. So the next thing to look at, and something that I found really helped me to learn, was to realize that really a lot of what we're looking at here is just based on different scales. So at the top part here, whoops, we've got sort of our large scale view. So we have this region from zero megabases to three megabases of a particular scaffold. So this is on the largest scale we have possible here. And then if you see these sort of red lines here, or what's referred to as the rubber band, we can now go down to another scale here known as the medium scale, which, um, sorry, I'm losing my pointer, um, which you can see these red lines of our rubber band again. So this is where we've come down from our large scale onto our medium scale, and we're starting to see some details of our browser here. And we can also go further down the page and look at a small scale. And you'll see a scale bar that actually says here, you're just, uh, that says 200 base pairs. So we're really looking on a much finer scale now. So now to look at what kinds of data can we actually see here. So first of all, if this were, were our medium scale from the previous slide, we would be looking at genes, um, and that would again be true in our smaller scale down here. And these genes would be based on predictions. They could be based from, um, I'm sorry, from Arabidopsis, or they could be from potato, uh, and that's something that you can select. We can also look at proteins, which are labeled here under um, oops. I'm having trouble getting the pointer just to stay up here for me. Um, under proteins, under CDS, which just stands for the code, coding sequence. We can also see ESTs here, um, and that's something that David talked about to us in depth. And also, we may also want to look at our markers. So now, you may be thinking, where does all of this data come from? And this is really where we get to the integration of the data. So a lot of the data will be coming from the International Tomato, Tomato Annotation Group. And this would include predicted genes and proteins um, using different prediction software. And as I mentioned, these, may, these predictions may be based on tomato, other Solanaceae, perhaps Arabidopsis. 
GenBank also provides a lot of the information in the forms uh, in the form of ESTs in our particular case. And these ESTs may or may not support our predicted genes and proteins. And we also have data from the soil genomics network itself in the form of molecular markers. So now if we go back to our different types of data, we can see on here our genes, proteins, ESTs, unit genes, which David also mentioned, and markers. So the genes and proteins are often coming from the annotation group, the ESTs from GenBank, and the unit genes and markers from SGN. So we can also select what kind of data we want to see by, looking, by going to the select tracks at the bottom of our screen. And just to show you here, um, this is what the select track screen looks, at, looks like. And you can turn something like your overview on or off. Um, you can also look at what gene models do I want to have on here. And again, the gene models would be from our annotation group. We've got our genetic loci from SGN, ESTs from GenBank, and other prediction features from the annotation group. So now I hope that you'll be feeling sort of in a better state of mind and that, this, and that I've convinced you at least a little bit that the Tomato Genome Browser could be a tool that would be useful to you. So, in this section of the talk, we've learned what a genome browser is, where we can find the tomato genome browser, the kinds of information we can look at, and where the information in the browser comes from.